what the f- did you do to Diddy that every woman he get with, they got to be Asian or Blasian? What the hell did you do with that vagina? And then why you want to beat all of them up, girl? What is that vagina like? What is that va- that Blasian vagina like, girl? You got me cursed, Mesa. The- <laughs> Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to, y'all, it's chilly out here, like, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com for these Ms. Hollywood DC shades. We got them in tortoise, black with the uh, gradient lens. Love them. They're like the best seller now. Uh, we got them in pink. So we got them in brown. We got them in a whole bunch of different colors. I love them. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it. If the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about my girl. Who's that wonderful girl? Can she be any cuter? Who's that wonderful girl? Look, there goes a suitor. In 1987, an old friend of mine nicknamed V stopped by Lakeshore to visit me and some other former buddies. He left with his mom two years earlier and moved to Minnesota. His outfit made me do a double take because he was wearing very expensive sneakers and clothing. He just got a pocket full of stones. Then he pulled a huge wad of bills out of his right front pocket. He flashed it and we could see that there was nothing there smaller than a 20. V told us that the quickest way to get a wad of cash was to get a pocket full of stones. They won't leave me alone. Got a pocket full of stones. For some reason, I had a hell of a time making sales, child. He had to learn the hard way, child. He was giving the cracky on credit. Man, this dude said that one girl had gave him her phone book or her address book, right? Because he didn't really have any clientele in his mind, maybe the clientele would be in the address book. Answer no. He was not, not for them streets, honey. So he learned the hard way. And from that point on when he had got burned because he still had to pay the dude back who that he got the rockets from, so he's in deficit now, fucking around with them stones. He was like, oh, no. Nah. Now, one day when he came home, his sister's boyfriend was like, oh, no, man. Mm-mm-mm. This, them streets ain't for you. Don't feel bad, Mark Curry. The streets ain't for everybody. Okay, but it, the streets ain't for me. But that don't mean that I don't like playing in the streets from time to time. But, you know, I have gotten hit by some cars, blink, if you know what I'm saying, you know, drug dealer cars. But you know, I mean, it, you live and you learn. I stopped selling drugs that same night. And when mom came home from work that night, I asked her if she could get me a job at the gas station. She said, yes. Child, that ain't, ain't work but for a second. How your mama get you a job and you show your ass at your mama job, Mark Curry? Yeah. How your mama get you a job at the gas station and you end up getting fired for stealing? After he got fired, he got suspended from school. Now what? 
So your ass ain't going to work or school. That's a concern. I guess my parents sensed that I was headed for trouble because dad started putting a lot of pressure on me to find a job, something with career possibilities. He urged me to consider construction work. But when I was too slow to get the hint, he drafted me into his renovation business. Okay, pause. If I didn't mention it before, his father was a master carpenter. Mark Curry is a master carpenter. Every payday, he'd find a new way to avoid paying me in full. He started charging me rent again, deducting it from my pay the first time without telling me that he intended to do so. The last straw was the week that he deducted rent and lunch fees from my check and then charged me for riding to work with him in his van. I had less than $50 after all the petty charges and I began to feel like God's stepchild. Yeah, your daddy was launching. I had secretly started applying for jobs elsewhere after dad started stiffing my paycheck. And I was hired by Eastern Airlines as a ramp agent the week after he returned to New Jersey. So dig this. I mean, he was working at that airlines, going through people's luggage, taking all kinds of things, boy. Could you imagine? Oh my God, getting your luggage and finding some of your nice things gone. Within a few weeks, some of the older hands started schooling me on how to make extra money on the ramp. They showed me how easy it was to open luggage and remove valuables like cameras, watches, and whatnot. And they taught me how to remove new credit cards from the mail. <laughs> oh my gosh. I also started hanging out among college students because a lot of my friends were attending Clark Atlanta University and Morris Brown College. I was on one campus or the other damn near every day for a while, hanging around the student center with a backpack and tow like I was between classes. Ninja, what? Do you know how many dudes used to do that at UDC? Like they did hanging out when in reality them niggas ain't got no job nor are they going to school they just dead picking up chicks when things got boring on campus many students hung out at a club called the warehouse which featured live entertainment a local group of rappers called the east point chain gang made their debut there in 1992 and was booed off stage three years later and under a different name the Goody Mob. The group had its first gold album and was credited with creating a new style of rap music called Dirty South. That's when they was singing, I believe, who's that peeping through my window? Pow, nobody now. Listen to that, that, that lyric. Who's that peeping through my window? Listen to that. How? Nobody now. And, and, and before we go further, I just want you to know how Mark Curry was already embedded in the business before his name was even known. Remember, he had already had affiliation with um, t Boz, Dallas Austin, Jermaine Dupree. Open Mic Night was hosted by Jazzy Faye and Bone Crusher, both popular Atlanta MCs, and the house band was called Little John and the Chronicles. Now, one day he was there, mm -hmm, listening to Little John and the Chronicles, their band, okay? And somehow the transference of music got into him so he was ready to get on the mic as i made my way back to my table i was stopped by this cat named greg taylor whom everyone called g Man, was that really you i thought that was biggie up there doing his thing i haven't heard a lot from him but just in that one instance it, it banged i ain't gonna lie when he was in the video 
just in that one instance in the video with P. Diddy and all the star cameos, his part banged. I'm not going to lie. He was like something about a jock grabbing my cock. And, you know, that always gets me hot and bothered. Okay. Even though I'm right here, you know, bumping purses with my wife. But it's just, I don't know. It was just hot. Because Biggie Smalls at the time was the hottest thing on the market. Him and Tupac, he compared the person... G compared Mark Curry with Biggie. I'm sure it was a compliment to him, but to me, no. But then let me shut up, because if somebody be like, nay, you over there giving Lil' Kim 1995, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm giving up Lil' Kim with that yellow fucked up wig on. The high I received from performing that night propelled me back to Club Oxygen. However, as the weeks passed by and no one showed up with a contract, my enthusiasm started to wane. Although I still received raves from the crowd, I didn't want to grow stale on them like so many other local musicians who were no more than furniture at the places where they performed. To avoid that hell, I stopped performing. I channeled my energies into writing my own songs and looking for somewhere to record them. Maybe G sensed my disillusionment because a few weeks later, after I stopped going to Oxygen, he offered me a job at the rim shop. The shop couldn't have opened at a better time. Most of the videos on MTV and BET show cars that have been pimped or redesigned with outrageous additions. Because of its location, the shop attracted the attention of a lot of local and national hip-hop stars. Hip-hop legend Eric Sermon moved to Atlanta in 1992. When I tell you y'all about to get some of this EPMDT, first of all, it was Juice, Juice, who told me that Misa and Misa girl, Misa girl, I love it, I love you girl. What the hell did you do to Diddy? That's what I want to know. What the fuck did you do to Diddy that every woman he get with, they got to be Asian or Blasian? What the hell did you do with that vagina on top of him, girl? Why is he stressed out like that? And then why you want to beat all of them up, girl? What the hell, girl? What is that vagina like? What is that va that blazing vagina like, girl? You got me cursed, Misa. The fuck? Anyway, from what I understand, Misa was messing with the dude Irk Sermon first. And then Diddy got her. And beat her up. Hip-hop legend Irk Sermon moved in Atlanta in 1992. Sermon is the E of EPMD. The initial stood for Eric and Parrish making dollars. Parrish Smith was the other member of the duo. In December 1991, rumor had it that Sermon paid $5,000 to thugs for breaking into Parrish's home. Sermon was supposedly upset about how Smith was running their businesses. After police caught one of the burglars, he claimed that Sermon was the mastermind. Sermon and Smith were on a national tour at the time, which lasted for almost a year. Police were hassling Sermon so much that he left everything he owned in New York and moved to Atlanta. The only thing he had when he arrived was the keyboard he used during the tour. Luckily for him, Dallas Austin agreed to support him financially until he got back on his feet. Ooh, y'all, remember when Eric Sermon had a nervous breakdown? He let Sermon live in the basement of the rim shop. Since he was always there, people got the impression that Sermon owned the shop. And I'm sure Eric Sermon ain't, ain't tell him anything different, which really increased traffic and sales. Hustlers from all over came into the shop just to say that they bought rims from Sermon. Since Sermon was trying to restart his career, G set up a recording studio for him in the basement. Child, you never know what these people be going through. 
Real talk. This man living in the basement of a fucking rim shop. Getting financed by Dallas Austin. One of our biggest spenders was a Detroit gangster known as Meech. His real name was Demetrius Flannery. Therein lies a tale, but for another day. In late 1993, Sermon started working with Keith Murray and Reginald Redman Noble. Sermon and Murray produced their first collaboration in 1994, which they sold to Jive Records, titled The Most Beautifulest Thing in This World. The title track was a monster hit. While helping Sermon get reestablished, Dallas Austin teamed up with L.A. Reid to create Rowdy Records in Atlanta. The label was run by Austin's brother, Claude. Initially, they had two artists signed to the label, Shades of Lingo, and a young rap duo called Illegal, featuring Mally G, a cat who called himself Lil Malik. The group's 1993 debut album, Untold Truth, produced a single hit, a number called We Get Busy, which featured Sermon, Bismarck e, and Claude. Malik left Atlanta and went west, changed his moniker to Mr. Malik, and started recording music with Suge Knight's Death Row label. Okay, now dig this. You know how the Suge be. Mm-mm-mm. Fuck a contract. Mm-mm-mm. Suge called up Claude and said, okay, Claude, you know how we gets busy. I need to meet with you so we can discuss Master G, Malik, Millennial, uh, M. Tume, whatever the hell his name is. But he over here. He's singing songs with me now. Claude Austin, it turned out, had a congenital heart defect. He suffered from heart murmurs. Suge Knight, who had just started Death Row, wanted to meet with Claude to discuss terminating Malik's contract with Rowdy. The dispute grew volatile, so Claude reluctantly agreed to meet on Suge's own turf. You say that you love me. 